Good evening, everyone. Welcome to beautiful downtown Grand Forks. This is Grand Forks City Council's Committee of the Whole for Monday, April 11th. Under item one, call to order 1.1, welcome and roll call. Weigel? Here. Dockler? Here. Weber? Here. Mock? Here. Cavani? Here. Sandy? Here. Veen? Here. We have a quorum. Great. Under item two, discussion items. Yep, Ms. Mock? Um, I guess just to address the elephant in the room, um, are we going to discuss the petition at all, or would that take a motion to suspend the agenda? Thank you, Ms. Mock. Mr. Gostad? Um, well, I, I'm not sure what are you asking to add something to the agenda, or? Well, I don't believe it's on the agenda as a listed item, but I think we probably have people with questions about it or expecting some level of discussion. Yeah, I mean, I, I guess we're at the 2.1. Are you, again, are you, you want to add a, a discussion item to the agenda? Is that so Is that, that people what it would can, take to discuss it? It would take a motion to, okay. to add to the agenda. And does that need to be unanimous? It does. Okay. Um, I guess I can make a motion to add a discussion of the petition to the agenda. I don't know if I can get a second or consent, but. Uh, sorry, I couldn't hear that. You had, what was the, mo the subject? Uh, to add a discussion of the petition for Fufung that's um, out there for the development agreement. There's, uh, there's a motion on the floor. I, I will second that motion. I do have a question though. There's a second by Veen. Yes, your question, Mr. So, so I would I would expect, especially to take action, it have to be either approved by the whole committee of the whole or be a item that's already on the agenda, right? To to take action. C correct. To have a discussion, does it have to follow the same guidelines? The, and I don't have the ordinance right in front of me, but the way I understand it is that if there's a change to the agenda, um, it requires um, uh, unanimous consent. Yeah, and I guess I was thinking it not necessarily as a change to the agenda. Can you have a discussion without it being on the agenda? Not a motion, not action, but just a discussion. Let me pull up the, the ordinance if you just give me a second. Council President Sandy, <clears throat> I would ask Mr. Gostin, just because we're in part of this uh, seven day review period, to discuss um, what that means. And our intent is obviously that seven day review period is going to be, I think, is concludes at the by the end of this week here. And it is going to be on the agenda for next week regarding uh, all the various items that went to uh, planning and zoning. Uh, last week and we'll also have some further updates but at least during that time period we'll be beyond the seven-day review process um, that was that was provided in in Ms. Storstead's memo last week Friday so I would just take as part of that discussion we are within this um, part of that seven-day review period of time and I would like to ask Mr. Costa to discuss the ramifications of that well thank you Mr. Freeland and, and the way the, the charter sets up is that, as you know, the decision has been made by Ms. Storstead. Um, and within that document, uh, at the end, it gave the uh, petitioners the opportunity to cure or amend those things that, are, that could be cured or amended within that seven day period of time. Um, I don't know what the, what the petitioners are, are doing or not doing at this period, at this time. Um, it could, you know, depending on what the discussion is, there could be uh, uh, ramifications as to how they may proceed or how they may not proceed as a result of that discussion. Um, so there is that concern as well is engaging in the, in the discussion in this in interim period of time could uh, sway things one way or the other, uh, rightfully or wrongfully. And so it, it may be best to allow the seven day period of time to expire and have the discussion if you're going to have the discussion after that period has expired and, and so that the totality of that review period is is done 
um, and, and the matter will be more solidified as to uh, what happens going forward. Thank you. Mr. Gosted, Mr. Veen, did that satisfy your question? Yep, he answered my question. Okay. So, um, I guess ultimately to refer to amend the agenda, um, just so I can summarize here, to amend the agenda, we have to vote and it has to be unanimous. Yes. And then um, our city attorney is suggesting that because we're still in the seven day remedy window, um, our discussion tonight could possibly affect what the petitioners are doing one way or the other. Um, and I guess at some point, I don't know if that puts us in, in a difficult, a, a different difficult spot. I yes, Mr. Gustin. I think it does. Uh, either way, whether it's a positive comment or a negative comment, um, we're within the period of time where the correction or amendment could occur, um, and it could influence what happens during the seven period of period of time, the seven day period of time. Okay. Um, Anyone else, Mr. Weber? Yes. Uh, so. I, I, I'm generally always in favor of, of discussion and, and, and uh, transparency of that sort. Of course, this is a legal matter, so I'm also inclined to follow the advice of our city attorney. Uh, I would put it back to uh, Vice President Locke in relation to her motion. Um, it, having heard from Mr. Gaustad and, and, and President Sandy, can, can you clarify the uh, intention of your motion? Um, or do you want your motion to stand? Can you give us a little more information based on what we've heard in the last couple of minutes here? Um, thank you, Mr. Weber. Um, I guess I received a number of calls and emails and I think um, members of the public are concerned and I guess with um, the primary election <laughs> being here, I thought it was prudent to maybe have this discussion now that we know the outcome of that, um, of their petition and the determination from the auditor's office. So um, I guess my intention was really if we wanted to discuss and I may be in a minority in that, um, desire. I just, I think we had a lot of people expecting discussion on the item tonight. And so I felt like I needed to at least express that. Yes, thanks. I, I didn't mean to uh, box you in a corner with, with my question. Um, let me try to offer uh, another angle on this. Uh, Mr. Galstead, you've indicated that there's a risk to uh, having a, a discussion about what is essentially an ongoing legal matter. Uh, however, there was a, a memo released by your office on Friday uh, that came to council. I'm, I'm sure it was publicly available, but I doubt that most people have uh, had a chance to look at that. Would you be willing to offer a, a quick summary of the key points from that? And perhaps that would uh, satisfy uh, what Vice President Mock is looking for. I don't want to put words in her mouth, but is that something that you could do? I can certainly summarize the, the decision and, and my analysis. Um, I, it, it'd be very brief and I can do that real quickly. Um, one is, do, one of the issues is that this matter isn't referable. Um, at least that was my recommendation. Um, there were issues with respect to the questions that were posed on the, on the petition, whether it uh, prompted uh, multiple questions within a ballot measure and whether there were issues about um, uh, extraneous uh, materials within the within the ballot itself. That was another issue. Another issue identified was the um, um, the questions that were posed um, or excuse me, the the form of the ballot um, and and not having the names of the committee excuse me, the members of the petitioner's committee on each page and the affidavit signature on each page. Um, and that, that was the, the other issue that was identified in the memo. And I think all of those uh, were then adopted by uh, Ms. Storstead in her, in her determination. Um, Mr. Go ahead. 
Can one second? Yes. Thank you, Mr. Weber. One second. Um, sure. Ms. Mock, can, can I ask you a quick question? What's the urgency with discussing it tonight versus next Monday? Um, I was thinking that if we as a council wanted to discuss putting an item on the ballot, perhaps that wasn't um, directly related to the petition, um, that the urgency was it being the 11th and the cutoff date for the primary ballot. And I, I guess with all the discussion around it, um, you know, I don't think any promises have been made to people, but I fear that people in general were expecting a question on the ballot for the primary. And if we would go to a special election, we'd be looking at timing that sometime after and additional cost. I mean, certainly we did that for Arbor Park. It's not insurmountable. Um, and I just was thinking for expediency and efficiency that when you have a ballot, ballot right now, maybe that was um, a good way to meet the need of the public. So. Very good. And, and I concurred with what Ms. Mock is saying that if there was a way to have that discussion, we need to have the discussion, whether it be now or next Monday or the Mondays after that, I'm sure that's not done. Um, we will continue to do it, but if there was some advantages to uh, talking about it sooner rather than later and get the concerns or whatever that we have as a council laid out so that we can um, have further discussion, there was, you know, a large number of, of signatures, and I think it, it warrants much more discussion. And um, again, the same, the sooner we have that, the better. So that's why I second to the motion. Yeah, certainly. I, I personally, I, I agree with you. Certainly there are a large number of people within our community that signed a petition to put something to a vote. Um, I think based upon City Attorney Gosted's suggestion, I think having that, that discussion tonight could lead to, a, or based upon the way he's saying it, it will lead to additional problems for us. And so I think we it would be prudent to wait until next Monday. And if that means we have to call a special election, we have to call a special election. We can do it. We've done it in the past. Um, and so I just, I don't think, we've already got, there are already legal consequences of what's going on right now. I think it, it would be, in my opinion, a bad idea to, to add additional issues. But that's just my opinion. A any Anyone else? Yes, please, President Sandy. Um, well, frankly, <laughs> it feels like we are already uh, having the discussion uh, because we've gone beyond just discussing uh, the motion and, and, and discussing the issue. Uh, so perhaps we, we should move forward with the vote. Um, as a matter of procedure. Very good. Should we do a roll call vote? Actually, let's just do a let's just do a regular vote. There's a motion and a second on the floor. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Aye. 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 Thank you. The motion fails for lack of unanimous with uh, Kavami, Sandy, and Weigel voting nay. Thank you, uh, everyone, for the discussion. Under discussion items, item 2.1, review requests related to special events, A, Sertoma, 4th of July, commingling request and letter of intent, and B, Greenway Takeover Fest, commingling request and letter of intent. Good evening. Good evening, um, President uh, Sandy and committee, media, committee members. Um, bringing to you today two long-standing events, Sertoma, 4th of July, and uh, Greenway Takeover. Both of them have their paperwork in, everything they need for co-mingling, and bringing it to you for a vote. Any comments or questions? Is there a move by Mock, second by Kavami. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Motion carries unanimously. Thank, Thank you. you. Item 2.2, .2, budget amendments for the health department. Uh, item A, epidemic. Epidemiology and lab capacity for infectious disease, disease grant and populations disproportionately affected by COVID-19 immunization initiative grant. Good evening, Ms. Swanson. 
Good evening, President Sandy and members of the Committee of the Whole. Before you are two budget amendments from the Health Department. Um, as Mr. Sandy articulated, um, they are for two different um, items. Uh, the first one is our epidemiology and lab um, grant. This is what pays for our testing and contact tracing. And you can see there's a summary of the funding that we have received thus far. It's simply aligning our budget years. We've received this funding from state resources and it's on a different fiscal year. And so we're bringing money forward into this fiscal year with an estimation of what we will need. The budget amendment is attached and the actual grant award is attached as well. Do you want me to go through the second one as well? Any comments or questions? Is there a motion to approve both? Move I move approval. Moved by Weber, second by Mock. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Motion carries unanimously. Okay. Yes, Ms. Swanson? On both. On both. Thank yes, you very ma much. Thank you. Item 2.3, light pillars for North 4th Street. We're, uh, Ms. Richards, we're doing some more street renovations downtown. Correct. The request tonight is to ensure that we can continue our streetscape design for the reconstruction of North 4th Street, which is scheduled for um, this summer. Um, the staff report kind of walks through the process that selected Badman Designs for the initial um, batch that were installed on Demers this last construction season. Um, eight more were commissioned for North 3rd Street, which would be installed this coming construction season. And then these, if approved, would be installed probably next summer, but as soon as possible after completion of the 4th Street reconstruction. Um, the request would be for four at 44,000 apiece, which is about 10% more than the previous, but seems warranted in that this was the price originally um, requested when it was first designed back in 2019. And then the cost would be split as in the past between 4815 Street and, Infra Street and Infrastructure has kind of carried the lion's share of this in the past with um, Fund 2163 picking up the slack off that first batch. Um, this would be split 50-50 between 4815 and, and 2163 coming out of some ADA restricted cash. Um, the staff report also includes the contract with Badman Designs, which is the request would be to amend that to add four more. And I'm certainly happy to stand for any questions. Any questions or comments? Mr. Bean? So just a quick question. Is there any issues with supply chain and being able to get the materials or products to get this made on time? Um, Mr. Badman has kind of said that there have been some issues and prices have gone up, but he's confident that he can get what he needs in the time frame that he needs them. Okay, Mr. Kavami. Move approval. Moved by Kavami. Second by Veen. Any other comments? Hearing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Motion carries unanimously. Thank you. Item 2.4 plans and specs and revised engineering engineers report for project 8407, 08, and 09, District 582, 353, and 583, Senator Sewer, Water Main. Storm Sewer for TK Industrial Park Development. Mr. Lieberman, good evening. Uh, thank you. Good evening, President Sandy and committee members. Uh, this project, uh, at the request of the developer Contractors Leasing, uh, will develop South 50th Street. Uh, this is south of Demers and west of the interstate. Uh, the project before you is the public portion of this. It's a re reminder, a combination public and uh, private investment. But this uh, entails the public investment of sewer, water main, and storm sewer along South 50th Street. Uh, this previously was brought before uh, the council in February where a special assessment district was created and uh, the council approved a task order agreement with WIDSETH of Grand Forks to perform design and construction services. Um, since, since that meeting, um, we have held a public input meeting, received inputs from two of the neighboring properties just general questions about uh, how they would benefit from this project, uh, not necessarily in opposition to it. Uh, we've also worked with WIDSETH in finalizing the design of this project and the uh, engineering department has reviewed those plans and specifications and concurs with them. And tonight we recommend those uh, for approval by uh, the council. Uh, during the planning uh, and design of this project, there were updates to the planning estimate, the, or the estimated cost of the project. Uh, some of those changes were somewhat substantial, so we are presenting uh, updated engineers' reports along with the staff report 
uh, to address that as well. Um, with that, um, I'll open it up for any questions. Any questions for Mr. Lieberman regarding item 2.4, Mr. V? So you, you have updated, you said the, the cost estimates. Um, That's correct. And you reviewed those and feel the, the new ones are, are good? We, we do. Okay. okay, thank you. Move, move. Great, moved by Veen. Is there a second out there anywhere? Second, second by Mock. Any other comments? Hearing none, all those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Motion carries unanimously. Thank you, item 2-5, plans and specs for Project 8472 West Elementary Redevelopment. Mr. Lieberman. Uh, thank you. This uh, project uh, is in support of Oxford, Oxford 2, the developer uh, who under a PUD will be redeveloping uh, the West Elementary School site, former West Ele Elementary School site uh, near 6th Avenue North and North 25th Street. Um, they, they will be uh, constructing about a dozen single family homes and that construction entails uh, sanitary, water main and storm sewer improvements in the right of way. Uh, the developer is proposing to privately fund those improvements and turn them over to the city for uh, operations and maintenance. Uh, the city has reviewed their design and we concur with their design of the public improvements. Uh, so tonight we are recommending approval of the plans and specifications. Any questions regarding 2.5? Mr. Kabami moves approval. Is there a second? I would second, but I do have just a question which Mr. Lieberman probably won't be able to answer, so I apologize. No problem. Second by Dockler. Go ahead, Ms. Dockler. So I think that this needs to move ahead in order for them to do anything. We're going to need to approve this. Um, however, I do have some concerns. Again, with whether or not any of these houses, while they are going to be single family built, whether they're going to actually be available to people within the community for sale. I have been contacted by some folks who have tried to reach out um, to see whether or not there would be any homes for sale at the West site. And the response to them has largely been that they're not sure yet. And I'm sure that's based on supply and demand issues, all kinds of things. Um, but that they're not sure yet and probably just rentals seems to be the overarching theme. And I do want to say that I find that very frustrating given about why this was kind of moved forward that even perhaps there would be a mix of rental versus single family owned um, and that the developer would be more than willing to work with folks that were interested in buying those new houses. Um, again, the Ward 2 community, I think, would benefit from being able to have new builds available to single family home buyers and not just renters in that area. So with that said, I'm happy to second the motion. Thank you, Ms. Stockler. Any other comments or questions? Hearing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Motion carries unanimously. Item 2.6, plans and specs for, and funding for Project 8509 Beacon Water Main Relocation. Mr. Lieberman. Thank you again. Uh, this is our third project tonight that engineering is presenting um, in support of developer initiatives in Grand Forks. Uh, this one is in support of the Beacon PUD. Uh, th this site's at the former Townhouse Hotel uh, site uh, where uh, Epic Companies will be, has demolished that and will be, be building three seven-story um, apartment uh, mixed-use facilities. Um, in the uh, design of the second facility, the um, design agent identified a conflict between the footings of the second facility and a 16-inch water main. Uh, engineering department previously presented that to council uh, as far as uh, seeking authorization to proceed with uh, plans and specifications and do an advanced purchase of materials. Some of these materials are uh, honestly in a little bit short supply and, and high demand right now, so we wanted to ensure that this work could be completed this summer. Uh, we have uh, worked with uh, Burien and Associates, the design agent, and um, have finalized the design plans for this project, and we concur and recommend approval of their plans and specifications. Uh, total, total estimated cost for this project is uh, $210,000, and that comprises three different components, um, $34,000 for construction and design services, uh, $60,000 for the materials that the city 
purchased in advance and will provide to the contractor. And then $116,000 for the contract, which we're recommending approval of plans and specifications for tonight. Um, these are these funds are all coming uh, fr scheduled to come from 5300 Waterworks. Uh, there is no special assessment with this. And uh, of note, the developer has offered a $15,000 cost share as they recommend it's that this solution is uh, in everyone's uh, best interest. So with that, we're recommending uh, approval of plans and specifications tonight. Thank you, Mr. Lieberman. Mr. Kamami. <laughs> So in our developers a development agreement with them, it states that should this conflict arise, the city's responsible. Is that correct? Is that why we're, we're covering the cost of this? I, I, I think the, um, the, the facts are we have about a 55 year old water main that is um, within a few feet of a, a foundation of a facility, whether it is um, permissible for the encroachment into that utility easement or not, it would present problems for the city to repair a break in the sure. future. It would be costly and difficult to repair it. So it, it is definitely uh, in our interest to relocate it and just pre prevent any conflict of such in the future. But we couldn't ask them to just shift the building over a little bit? Or did that discussion happen already, I'm assuming? It, it did. Um, there's a um, public plaza um, planned for between the first and second buildings and a certain feature of that requires a certain dimension and that has been squeezed as tightly as it can. Um, so at this point, uh, the solution that's presented is, is about the best we can get without further encroachment on that water main. Thank you. Any other comments or questions? Uh, I'd entertain some kind of motion. Oh, I'll move approval. Thank you, second. Mr. Weber. Is there a second? Second. Second by Weigel. Thank you so much. Any other comments? Hearing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Aye. Motion carries uh, Mr. Kavami dissents. Item 2.7 plans and specs and funding for Project 8510 City Hall parking lot C expansion. Mr. Lieber. Uh, thank you. Um, with the work that's going on near City Hall here with the Franklin on 4th development and the Grand Forks Herald building redevelopment, uh, the city staff anticipates a loss of approximately 30 parking stalls that are used by uh, city employees and the public uh, on a daily basis. Um, as such, um, engineering department was tasked to uh, propose an expansion of uh, city parking lot C. Uh, which is along uh, North 4th Street and University Avenue. Um, this expansion will provide an additional 28 parking stalls in the parking lot itself. Uh, as part of the design, uh, engineering proposed to install diagonal parking on 4th Street. Since then, there's been a discussion and we're putting that on pause just to ensure that it's really needed before we go ahead and take that uh, step. So tonight's uh, proposal is approval of plans and specifications for the parking lot expansion itself. Uh, the estimated cost is uh, $240,000. That is fully city funded. Uh, we are proposing to use fund 4815 initially uh, with uh, reimbursement from the JDA uh, at a later date, which would correspond to the sale of a clock tower lot in part. So with that, uh, engineering is recommending uh, and requesting approval of plans and specifications. Great. Thank you, Mr. Lieberman. Any comments or questions about the parking question, lot? Question, if I may. Mr. Weber, go ahead. Can you can you help me understand the uh, the net gain loss of parking spaces with this move? Uh, with with the parking lot expansion only, it's roughly break even. If the diagonal parking were to be installed in the future, there would be a net gain of roughly twenty parking. Uh, parking spots and and I apologize I, I should be better informed on this but can you help me to understand again you just said it but why why can't we just have the diagonal parking places or at least plan for those and and avoid this expensive uh, expansion of surface parking in our downtown I, I understand it in the past there's been discussions about whether that stretch of 4th Street should be uh, one-way traffic or two-way traffic uh, it is currently one-way traffic, and um, rather than changing the traffic flow, 
or introducing diagonal parking, we want to establish that the parking lot expansion meets the parking need. If it does, then there is no, it's unnecessary to install those diagonal parkings, uh, parking stalls. If it does not, then we would uh, look into that as an additional uh, thing that we could accomplish. Let, let me rephrase the question then. It is the current parking lot and the addition of diagonal parking, would that be, uh, what, would, what would the net gain loss be of, of that solution? Keeping the parking lot the way it is, selling the, uh, the, the clock tower parking, and adding diagonal parking? It, it would be roughly a net gain of uh, approximately 20 parking stalls. So we already have the road paved. Um, and uh, what, what would we, that's a lot of money to add um, parking that we could just have on the street. I, yeah, um, I think what Mr. Weber is suggesting is we don't put in the flat parking lot and we just put in the diagonal parking. Does that cover it? Oh, thanks. Yes. Thanks, President. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Uh, I, I understand the question. That would not that would not cover the requirement. We are losing roughly thirty parking stalls as a result of the redevelopment. Uh, sure. So it would be a net loss of about ten parking spots, 10. Mr. Weber. And so uh, ten parking spaces and, and uh, roughly a quarter million dollars is that that's what we're looking at to yeah. cover that. Easy math. Yeah, that's what we're looking at. Very good. Thanks for answering my question. Perhaps um, are you suggesting we should just do the diagonal parking and wait and see how it goes, and then if people yes. are complaining about parking, maybe then we should look yes. at doing the lot. Hey, yes, that's not please. a bad Thank idea. You. Good idea, Mr. Weber. What What do you think of that, Mr. Feeling? <clears throat> well, number one is you know we do like it or not, people like convenient parking. And so the, really the thought of when we exchange the lots is that we would expand the existing surface parking lot so that we would get city employees um, as close as possible to City Hall, you know, for winter or for night or all those sorts of things. I think secondarily, um, we were looking at um, in the future, and even by doing a surface parking lot, if we somehow we kept growing as a community, we wanted to do a mixed use development with a parking structure on there, which would, would, would make sense. Um, what we're doing now is just a nice interim step for us to get to something further as we want to develop. And I think it's really a, it's a positive for city employees that are going to give up some parking. That was always the downside of, of um, providing the Herald lot as part of the development. Let's try to substitute it with something that's relatively close. Not as close, but it relatively as close. I will also say, Council President Sandy, I have been in <clears throat> Tom Falk, the county commission chair, has reached out to me and they are, the, 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 we'll call it the clock tower adjacent lot. They are interested in negotiating with the city because they would like that as part of their future expansion. And so before before we, um, the JDA or some redevelop, it's, they, they would like a conversation with the with the Jobs Development Authority that I think is under the ownership and, and make sure that they get probably first tabs at that just because that's a really strategic lot for their future development in that area. Um, President Sandy? Yeah. Yes, Mr. Weber. If I may, um, I don't mean to be insensitive to the convenience or the safety of uh, a city staff in any way, but uh, we do have a situation where I believe we have well over 4,000 parking spaces downtown, and uh, during the day we uh, generally have uh, the, the vacancy rate on those spaces is, is quite high. We, we have underutilized uh, parking downtown and it seems that there's a great deal of parking. So that, that's enough discussion for me. Thanks. Thank you, Mr. Weber. Mr. Veen? <clears throat> um, I think it's not a matter of if, but when we will need the parking spaces. Um, costs seem to never go down. They only go up, typically. Um, during construction, especially when they're looking at the other lot, I think the property could be used um, and I just think it's, I don't know, I guess I'd like to support what the staff is presenting and, and be in favor of moving forward with it. Thank you, Mr. Veen. Mr. Kavami? Is that, is that a motion? I don't know. Was that a motion? That was a motion. That was a motion. Okay, moved and seconded by Kavami. Further discussion? Ms. Ma? What was your proposal that you had put out there? 
Um, I'd suggested perhaps we just do the diagonal parking first and then wait and see how it goes. But I, I do understand Mr. Veen's comment is certainly true that prices don't go down. And if we do think it's inevitable, which city staff seems to believe so, we're probably just better off doing it all right now. Any other comments? For the good of the order, yes, Ms. Ma. Um, Mr. Phelan, the idea that you had mentioned the mixed use, I mean, we would be a ways away from that. You imagine that if something like that were to come forward, I don't know if there would be a proposal made in underground parking, but we're not there quite yet. Is that yeah. your thought? Council President Sani, Council Vice President Maka. Yeah, I don't think we're at there, but I think once that, um, the Lions Project, I know it's got a different name now, but I think once that gets further developed, I think it's going to open people's eyes for other opportunities. And that next really great opportunity is probably the one north. The city's going to own the lot, so uh, we'll be able to facilitate something um, really good. Pre still preserving our parking, but maybe add some further value to, the, to that spot. But in the meantime, I'm thinking that's five, ten years out from, from today. Thank you, Ms. Mock. Thank you, Mr. Phelan. Any other comments, questions? Hearing none, all those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Aye. Motion carries. Mr. Weber dissents. Thank you. 2.8, plans and specs for and funding for Project 8515, sanitary sewer cleaning in easements. Mr. Lieberman. Uh, thank you again. This project is in support of our Public Works Water Department. Um, periodically there's a need to uh, clean uh, through via jetter truck and televise our sanitary sewer mains specifically mains that are located in backyard easements or side yard easements uh, where public works equipment is just simply too large to get in there so this was last done in 2013 and there's roughly five to six miles of pipe that are cleaned and televised through this effort so um, engineering has put together plans and specifications and a, a cost estimate of roughly $95,000 uh, to be paid for from Fund 5200 water, a Wastewater Collection System. Um, engineering is requesting approval of plans and specifications for this effort. Thank you, Mr. Lieberman. By televising, you put that out on City Channel 2? Or? We do not. Oh, I Thank see. goodness. <laughs> Any... Uh, any comments or thoughts? Moved by Kavami, second by Veen. Any other comments? Hearing none, all those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Motion carries unanimously. Thank you. Item 29, bid award for Project 8401, District 761, reconstruction of South 12th Street from Park Drive to 25th Avenue South. Mr. Lieberman. Uh, thank you. The next two staff reports are some good news items. We've continued to get good bids this year on our construction projects. On South 12th Street, uh, we had a bid opening last week, Thursday. We received three bids. Uh, the low bidder was Op Construction. Uh, their bid was 7.6% under the engineer's estimate. Uh, so we're recommending award uh, to Op Construction uh, in the amount of $1,477,256.20. Any comments or questions? Mr. Veen moves approval, second by Kamami. Any other comments? Hearing none. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Motion carries unanimously. Item 210. Bid award for Project 8469, District 765, reconstruction of South 20th Street from 20th to 24th Avenue South. Mr. Lieberman. Uh, thank you one last time tonight. Uh, we received bids uh, for South 20th Street reconstruction last week. Uh, three bids were received. Uh, op Construction was the low bid on this project as well. Uh, their bid was 10% below engineer's estimate, so we're, we're very pleased to be getting bids like that uh, this late in the bidding season. So it's a good, good environment. Uh, we're recommending award of the contract to Op Construction uh, in the amount of $1,068,098.90. Great. Thank you, Mr. Lieberman. Any questions regarding... Reconstruction, Mr. Kamami moves approval. Second by Veen. Any other comments? Hearing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Motion carries unanimously. Thank you for Thank all you. the heavy lifting tonight, Mr. Lieberman. Item 211. Bit of work for Project 8368, rehabilitation of Demers Avenue overpass and Washington Street. Pedestrian, 
underpass. We brought in the ace tonight, Mr. Grasper. <laughs> thank you, President Sandy. Um, I just want to acknowledge also, uh, thank Ed for all the heavy lifting on the, on the items ahead here. Um, you know, he could have done one more, but <laughs> no, just kidding. Thank you. Uh, if you remember this one, uh, uh, it's been before this uh, body before a couple of times. It's one of those federal projects that it comes to you multiple times and you don't see it, uh, you know, for three months or six months in between, uh, you know, your last actions. But uh, this is one of those that we ask for federal dollars uh, for. Uh, it's on the regional system. Uh, it, and there's two different locations. Um, the, the DOT is the lead on this thing. Uh, the one location is is the uh, the Skyway here, uh, Demers Avenue Skyway. Uh, there's some repairs uh, that need to be done there. Um, some spalling on the deck and the, and the the kind of the side rails. You see the concrete there, uh, abutments on the on 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 the edges. Then also uh, down underneath on on the pier. Uh, and some of the footings. So it's basically just some structural repairs that need to be done on, on these types of structures periodically. Similarly, the other one that they bid uh, as a package was the uh, pedestrian uh, underpass there on Washington Street. It's the one uh, nearest the library by Library Circle. Again, there's uh, uh, some panels that need to be repaired there. Uh, the, the, the top of that box, box culvert is actually part of the, the paving surface. The, Adjacent panels come right up there, and they and, and they rest right on top of the uh, uh, right next to the roofs, so that they they become a seamless transition. Uh, those need a little bit of work, uh, as well as some uh, some sidewalk work that needs to be done uh, underneath. Um, the DOT opened bids on this uh, last week. The low bidder is uh, PCI Roads LLC for one million nine hundred fifty nine thousand six hundred and seventy six dollars and ten cents. Uh, this was uh, of note 27% uh, above the engineer's estimate, and I, I attribute some of that to the fact that uh, you know this is an in-town project. I think sometimes the DOT uh, engineers aren't aren't always able to adjust for you know urban setting type costs. So um, we are recommending award. We do need a budget amendment uh, on this. We're anticipating our local share is about $243,000. And so we're recommending award plus the budget amendment to do this work. Thank you, Mr. Grasser. Any comments or thoughts? Mr. Veen, question, you move approval? Great. There a second by Mock. Thank you, any additional questions or comments? Hearing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Which carries unanimously. Thank, Thank you, Mr. Grasser. Item 212, Residential Development Master Planning. Mr. Freeland. Hey, Council President Sandy, we have uh, two presentations that are a little bit tied together, so trying to really make the best use out of uh, the land use plan that we've been working on and also some of the transportation planning. So Ryan's going to carry the ball in the residential, and then Gary Lorenz, uh, our fire chief, has done some work on land use planning, transportation, and you know fire protection areas. So. I think we'll get through Ryan and have him and Maureen and Al have some thoughts on some of the housing development stuff and just get some feedback on that one. And then that's what Gary's looking at, going into the budget season and that uh, land use plan, just looking for get some feedback from you on that. And, and then we'll come back to City Council based upon some of your feedback tonight. So with that, I'll hand it over to Ryan. Thanks, Mr. Phelan. Mr. Brooks, good evening. Thank you, Council President uh, Sandy. I'll. Uh, are you doing a presentation? Yeah. Okay. I'll be brief. Please. Yeah. Um, so residential development master planning and 2050 land use plan. Um, we went through this. It's going to be on your agenda next uh, next week for uh, preliminary approval. Um, but I will, I'll give you a quick rundown of, of what we have before us. So, uh, oh, sorry. So the 2050 land use plan, um, these are kind of things that we look at in uh, planning out for the 30 years. It's uh, something that we update or have been updating about every five to 10 years. And um, uh, in the past, it, it also coincides with our transportation plan, uh, anticipates growth trends, those types of things. So I won't read all those bullets, but they're there for your um, knowledge. 
the, the categories that we look at, agricultural, uh, rural residential, urban residential, commercial, industrial, mixed use, public, and recreational open space. Uh, the areas that we have in our prior priority growth area, uh, there's uh, nearly 6,800 developable acres. Uh, in the urban reserve, there's over 7,000. and rural reserve, there's nearly 27,000 as you start to get into our area that we look at. Population projections, out to 2050, we're looking at nearly 100,000 people. Uh, so as you start to think about things that we have to plan for, that's jobs and houses. And now we get into really the, the plan that we have. Uh, here's the 2045, and then here's the 2050. I kind of put them side by side so you can see the comparisons. Uh, one of the big notes, uh, in the 2045, they use gray for industrial, and in the new plan, we're, we're showing purple, um, uh, which is a more traditional um, uh, color for industrial and planning maps. Um, the, uh, the acreage that we're uh, increasing quite a bit in the industrial area, and uh, in some cases, our residential is growing as well, uh, but we have noticed the trend of smaller lots. So our density is getting uh, higher on, on residential. Uh, and uh, some of the things that we looked at too with the plan were activation areas. So you're seeing a lot of infill too that we concentrated in and the documents. Uh, you can certainly take a look and, and find out a little bit more. But here's the land use categories and this gets into a little bit of the acreage uh, that we have uh, for each area. As I said, we started getting into mixed use and started looking particularly at infill as we, as we looked at the, the option as we move forward, uh, taking particular attention to mall, uh, the Grand Cities Mall, Columbia Mall, some of the downtown areas as well. Uh, 32nd, trying to infill some of those areas. Uh, the, uh, as I said, April 6th, planning and zoning uh, gave uh, preliminary approval, will be uh, before you uh, next month, this is part of our comprehensive plan, which is part of Chapter 18 of our of our code. I uh, want to talk a little bit more about some of the new developments that we have going on, uh, just to show you some of uh, that we're not just dealing with development on the edges. We're actually looking at internal things going on as well. I think we talked a little bit right before this about the uh, Lions development. That's Franklin on 4th is the new name. Uh, the Beacon, you guys are approving. Uh, some things that the engineering's just brought before you. All of Ann's another one, as, as you know, in the downtown. Um, so there's lots of things going on. We have Gateway Drive. We have some redevelopment, even with the Career Academy, uh, Impact Academy that's going on. And certainly the city was involved in on that as well. So I won't go through each of those, but this is kind of a layout. Uh, we'll talk a little bit more about the Grand Valley. Uh, coming up here as well. So as we start to look at uh, residential lots and what's available, this kind of delves into some of those areas and I, I'll kind of orient uh, you to where we're at. Up on this northern map, here's Discovery School. Here's Columbia Road as it cuts through. Uh, the yellow lots that you're seeing are still lots that are platted but still need infrastructure. Uh, here's Toby Lane in green here. And then to the north of that is another cul-de-sac that's been platted, and the infrastructure is just waiting to go in on that as well. Um, and then uh, south of Discovery, there's some areas there that are available for development. As you go down to the map that's uh, to the below, here's King's Walk. Uh, here's the Crary development down here. And then uh, you have Shady Ridge uh, to, the, to the east here. Uh, roughly 480 platted lots for single family. That's about three to four year supply, if you remember right, where about 120 lots uh, per year that get um, uh, built on. And, um, and so as we start to get down to that number, there are always some folks that hold on to lots. They aren't ready to build the next year after they buy. So some of the things that we're looking at. So I'll get into a little bit of the Grand Valley development. Uh, phase one, uh, again, here's uh, North Wa or South Washington here. Here's 62nd Avenue South. And they'll be coming before us next month uh, for phase one, I believe. And this is kind of that area in this general vicinity. It's uh, this next one I'll show you a little bit of the layout. 
uh, 62nd now. North is uh, to the left here, 62nd Avenue. You can see the, the lots that they have uh, filled in here. Um, there's also obviously the pond, that's a requirement now with development, and then the parkland. These still need to be vetted, just so you know, it hasn't gone through planning and zoning. We're just kind of showing you uh, some of what they're working on. I think there's a lift station, I believe that's down here on lot 13 as well. So those are all parts of that development that need to occur. Getting into a little bit of the goals, um, and this uh, harkens back to 2016. Uh, when we discussed special assessment deferrals. Um, back at that time, we were looking at ways to increase our, increase our residential lot supply. And, you know, those are some of the solutions there that we looked at, uh, adjusting special assessment time periods, 20 to 25 years. Uh, that was put in permanent change, uh, decreased special assessment interest markups uh, from one and a half to one. That was put into ordinance. That was a permanent change that was done. Uh, eliminated upfront bonding. That was expired in end of 2018. I know Al may have some thoughts on that as well. Deferred special assessments for projects. We did do that. Uh, that was three year deferrals and that ended as of 2019. Here's some of the lots and this was at the end of 2018 that this map was done, but these are some of the lots that were assisted with that special assessment deferral. So again, you're in Discovery here, Kings Walk, here's the Prairie Development, Prairie Wood here, and then a little bit of Shady Ridge over in this area here. And here's uh, uh, some of the single family, as I said, we're usually in the 100, bouncing around that 100 mark. Uh, townhomes, uh, those have gone, they're a little bit more, um, depending on what a market a developer is working on. We had a peak here in 2014 with just over 100, uh, but we've kind of slowly increased those townhomes as well. And then the platted lots have really been bounced, bounced around quite a bit, so that's what we're trying to show here. Getting into a little bit too, some of the major projects that we're working on, there's a 42nd grade separation um, piece that uh, we're working on. And this is kind of going to start to lead into some of the discussion that Gary's about to have with you. And I-29 interchange, as you guys know, we had a 47th is typically what it's referred to as, but some of the lines, alignments that we're looking at are, are down at 49th due to some of the requirements from the state in terms of spacing. Um, but uh, with that, I believe that's my last slide. Oh, no, one more here where we show the I-29 interchange a little bit further back. Uh, one thing I did want to point out, uh, we've, we've heard a lot maybe in the paper about the uh, Sanford uh, Health uh, purchase. It's 60, I'll say 60 plus acres and roughly in this area right here. Uh, it was recently uh, showed up on the county file. So uh, with that, I'll kind of uh, turn this over, I believe, well, if, unless you have any questions for me. Any questions for Mr. Brooks about his brief presentation? Yes, Mr. Veen? Well, I think there'll be a lot more to come. So a lot of great work, I appreciate that. Just one, one thing, we didn't note the South End Bridge in any of this. And uh, I do know we have an issue as we expand into rural water. Um, there's gonna have to be some level of agreement regardless coming forth. I'm assuming on both those issues, are they being considered? I, um, I'll go ahead. Do you mean the <clears throat> the Merrifield Bridge or the <coughs> Inter City Bridge, Mr. The Green? Inner City Bridge. Yeah, I think what we were planning on doing that. I know East Grand Forks uh, Council President Sandy and I were speaking of that uh, earlier today. That East Grand Forks would uh, like to re-engage you regarding the the, the <coughs> Inter City um, Bridge matter. And I think right now at the MPO, I don't know if the, there was a formal motion, but it seems like the I guess the highest ranked bridge is the 32nd Avenue South. And so what I, um, they'd like to move forward with an, uh, additional RFPs and RFQs and doing that. What I've um, sought some uh, insights is that let's bring that back to city council um, at some point where we, um, Stephanie Halford is the new MPO executive director. I don't think she's planning to be in place until May. But if we could wait to engage on the matter, and plus we have an election coming up too, 
uh, with uh, three, uh, you know, ward people um, in that area is to have a further discussion, probably in that May June time frame, if that's okay. And the other thing I really wanted is the MPO executive uh, group to provide a briefing about, you know, we we conducted some studies, here are the rankings, and we haven't had that opportunity just because we've been in flux. Uh, at the MPO side, but uh, if you want it sooner rather than later, that's what I was thinking on that. Of all the ramifications, they would like to partner with you. They'd like to do some further studies, and as part of those further studies, I'm sure they're going to want to have a 50-50 cost share with you as the City of Grand Forks. Yeah, I, I think that's great. I think we just want to make sure it's moving forward. You know, yeah. it's been through the MPO. We've done the studies. City Council has already taken a position on that. But I think um, there's more to come, I would yeah. guess, that, because I, there's I, a long road to get something like that implemented. There is, and we got so many, uh, well, we got a lot of big balls in the air uh, right now, but uh, I certainly, uh, if this council wanted to bring it sooner, because the City Council of Grand Forks hasn't seen the briefing from the, the MPO, you know, all the studies that have gone on and all of, that's that's been absent. I certainly could put it on a future city council meeting under presentation so people can get an update at least kind of where we're at and set some direction. And I know there was a consultant that was hired and, and I didn't follow a lot of that committee process and, and obviously Ken and, and Jeannie, you're our, our representatives on there. And so how we're best, I, all I'm saying is uh, East Grand Forks wants an answer. Hey, we'd like to re-engage. And what I've, I've said to him is that um, we've got all these kind of transitions going on right now. I don't know when best is to re-engage. I know we need to do it sooner rather than later, but I want to make get it back to you at the right time. Sure. Thanks. Any other questions for Mr. Brooks? Thank you, Mr. Brooks. Appreciate it. Ms. Thorsted? Yes. Good evening. Thank you. I'm going to go back to Mr. Brooks' previous slide here. So back um, when some of these actions were taken, just um, a little bit of review of what our office did to try to best communicate the changes that had been um, made to the special assessment program. Um, when we did the deferrals, um, we did hold a meeting with all realtors, uh, try to get the word out as best as we could, have spreadsheets available for uh, those properties involved um, with those deferred special assessments, try to communicate information so it got down to the property owner uh, and we did file with the county um, with all those um, <clears throat> properties uh, regarding future special assessments so uh, when title searches were done um, there was uh, information attached with the property uh, letters were sent out um, annually uh, just with an update on the timing and, and the dollar amount of those specials all along um, interest does accrue so um, there was capitalized interest uh, involved. Uh, what we always offered the opportunity to prepay if they did not want to um, pay that uh, increased <laughs> interest. Um, I think we did uh, the best we could trying to communicate. There's always going to be a small percentage that are caught off guard, unfortunately, um, when property owners um, ultimately have to pay those special assessments. So that's st some of the risk you take. Um, but I, I think uh, for the most part, that information got communicated the best it could. Um, some of the takeaways, uh, I believe, based on this slide that I have up here, at the time uh, we, we did decrease the special assessment interest markup that covers the city's risk. Uh, we thought we could take it down from 1.5% to 1%. And looking at that, I think we could go one step further and look at a half percent and then uh, five years down the road, maybe we reanalyze that and, and see if that was an appropriate move. So if council has an interest in that, we can take a look at that policy. Uh, and also uh, with uh, the, the uh, right now you've got uh, markup for miscellaneous finance, engineering, uh, carrying costs. I believe with that miscellaneous 4%, we could take a look at reducing that down to 2% um, to cover our costs. And then like with the, as with the markup, we can just reanalyze that. It's been five years. We can look at it again in, in another five years to make sure we're covering our costs on that. So just a couple of things if, if council wants to take a look at moving those items forward. Um, the other thing um, with your flood protection specials, we could uh, entertain looking at a three to five year uh, special assessment deferral uh, if that would help um, development. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Al if he has additional thoughts. Could, could, could we ask a question? Mm -hmm. Yeah, Mr. Veen, please. Just, just real, real quick, like, in these recommendations that you're talking about, okay. some of the decreases, could you just, when you put the numbers together, let us know how much that averages per lot? 
or what those impacts might be. I actually thought with interest rates going up, you might be saying they'd go the other yeah. direction versus well, going down, right. and, and, and there's a cost that's involved in that. So that's, I was just wondering about that. Um, Mr. Veen, President Sandy, members of the committee. So I, I would not recommend decreasing um, the 4% that we currently charge for our carrying costs because um, rates are going up. So I would keep that at where it's at. Um, and then uh, we can reanalyze that down the road. Um, but looking at the 4% the for miscellaneous with advertising, publishing costs, um, things like that, I, I believe that we can bring that cost down to the 2% and, and relook at that if that's not seeming to cover. Um, but rates are going the other way. I, I want to make sure we, we uh, don't take too much risk on, but I think it's something that we can take a look at and reanalyze down the road, make sure we're covering our costs. So, can, I, can I ask a general question? Mm -hmm. we're, we're talking about incentivizing development. Are, is there a concern with city administration that there aren't enough lots currently available for sale? I haven't heard that part of the story yet. I, I think I think we're concerned. You know, when you look at that <clears throat> three-year period of time, we know that infrastructure takes at least two years. And so, when you, well, I think when we are approaching three years, we're really at we're getting to the edge. If if we don't start doing, so we don't want to come back to you in two years from now, and we're we're going to say is that we're we're going to be too short, and we don't have enough time to do it. So that's why we're talking right now is this infrastructure now, it's going to take at least two years before you're building on any of these uh, lots that we may start building even this year. If, if, uh, if I could uh, just comment on that, um, you know, from, from an engineering perspective, you know, after the 97 flood, we invested a lot of dollars and CDBG dollars and other dollars that went into basically setting up some of the trunk infrastructures of the areas, uh, primarily south of town, uh, water mains and lift stations and things like that. Um, a lot of the work that we've actually done since that time, because the lift stations were there and, and the, the trunk water, a lot of that was almost like a quasi-infill. And I'm not using the term in the same way a lot of people might. But it, we, they were areas that we had to, we had to address the new, regu new regulations. This goes back a ways on, on stormwater ponds. So that, that kind of was one of the newer trunk pieces that had to, had to be addressed. But otherwise, we, we kind of were, were um, uh, a lot of the things were set up to, to take us all the way down to 62nd Avenue South, you know, the, the golf course in that area uh, and, and, and areas east and, and even somewhat west. Um, those areas then from a time perspective, because you got most of that real the heavy duty trunk in, only probably takes a year or so to be able to turn that area into, you know, where, where you can start uh, putting in your subdivision level uh, infrastructure and start selling lots and we're and because that's been going on so long I think we've kind of forgotten how long it takes to really bootstrap up a, a really new area uh, as we start crossing some of these boundaries um, but that's what we're talking about doing now we're looking ahead and seeing that it you know it's it's a two year and two and three year development process uh, to to uh, initialize a new area new in this case I can use an example would be south of 62nd Avenue South we need a lift station, need to figure out the stormwater drainage, the stormwater holding ponds, staying in compliance with the Corps of Engineering requirements, all those kinds of things. Um, that process, we've actually jump-started a little bit. The council has given us approval to uh, design and bid uh, the, the lift station. This would be the one on the, on the uh, west side of Washington. Uh, it's at the intersection, if you can think of where it is, uh, 20th Street and, and uh, 60. Uh, Ninth Avenue South, um, basically in the center of that section of land, um, but uh, that's actually encompassed about three to four months worth of work already. So when we count my three-year time frame, we've accomplished maybe you know four to six months of that timeline already, just by the actions we've already taken. A uh, reminder to the City Council: we've also initiated in our strategic infrastructure growth areas, uh, the, the area if we, if we go west of town, uh, south of Gateway Drive. Uh, you know, we, we put, put a lift station out there and we've done some water main extensions in that area. Uh, generally, that, that undeveloped land, I'm going to say south and west of Walmart in that, in that general area, uh, is, 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 we've kind of set up some of the basic infrastructure there. We've also done uh, some south of 32nd Avenue. Uh, that's not really residential, so I'll kind of skip over that. But, you know, we, we've, we've been setting some of these areas, uh, areas up. Um, 
but again, it takes about two years or so from the time you, you kind of just take a bare area like that that doesn't have any trunk and get it to a point where you can start uh, delivering the subdivision area and uh, developing lots. So that's why we're, we're looking at that lead time uh, component and, and projecting out and, and our, our supply of lots are gonna get to be pretty thin. Mr. Grasser, how come we haven't, uh, yeah, I think, I think ultimately, I guess I'd like to see your recommendations at the council meeting next week. I am morbidly curious why we spent a few million dollars putting in a pump station south of Walmart when not one single lot has been plotted out there. And I know that's not your issue, that's our issue, right? We're the ones that approved that and nothing has happened there. Well, if I could address that, though, the, the thing that we were trying to address at that point, uh, Stephas wanted to do some expansion. We didn't have enough sanitary sewer capacity. That lift station actually uh, services also north of Gateway Drive. Mm -hmm. it, it's, we're, we stretched that one a long, long ways. And that was really the trigger for that area, and, and that's the, the growth. We, you're correct, we haven't done any, uh, we haven't seen a lot of commercial or residential building out there, but uh, Stephas has done some expansions and some of those other businesses out there. Uh, are tied into that lift station. Okay. Um, just kind of a quick comment, I think because, uh, you know, I know we, we experimented with the, the three-year uh, deferral uh, before and some of these other uh, mechanisms that are still in place. Um, and I, there's some pros and cons to some of that. I, I won't get in, I mean, everybody's probably got an opinion on that. I'm just gonna say that when we, as we break into some of these new areas where the, the developer's gonna need to invest a little more money and a little longer time to, to, to start you know, generating some of that rate of return. You know, I, I think there, if we want the developers to get in and do a robust development, uh, my sense is we probably need to do some level of, 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 of incentivization. Uh, whatever that is, I'm not saying what that is necessarily today. There's, there's different combinations of things that, that we've been kicking around as staff we can talk about that more at a later date, but uh, it's just I'm trying to describe in my long-winded manner what we're dealing with now and generating and in, jumping into brand new areas is that it's a little bit different animal than what we've been used to for the last 15 or 20 years. Thank you, Mr. Grasser. Does anyone have any other questions for Mr. Grasser? Are we in? Oh, yeah, Mr. Kalama. So if, if I'm to understand correctly, so the intent would be at council, you would maybe have some ideas on mechanisms. You know, the three-year deferral was a success with some drawbacks, and maybe you might have some solutions that you'd present to us that could maybe get around that, but at the same point, jumpstart our ability to serve with new lots. Yes, except that I will be on vacation next council meeting, but we can do it. Okay, Mr. Lieberman coming. carries a lot of the water around here. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. I think the other thing we want to do, we knew we know one development's going to come on the south, and there is some interest um, south of Walmart. Two, we want to try to get to you in advance so that as they start moving through planning and zoning, we're not, you know, jumping into one another. And so we'll plan to bring some uh, suggestions back to you at City Council meeting next week, Monday, uh, for your consideration. Great. Anybody have any other comments or concerns about that? Excellent. Thank you. Good plan. Uh, so, Chief Lorenz, Fire Protection Master Planning. You're going to be brief, Chief? I didn't say that. <laughs> Chief, is this, is this the plan I was supposed to come and meet you on and I still haven't got there yet? It is. It is. <laughs> okay. so you, you know, you're still welcome, though, anytime. So, good evening, President Sandy and members of the Council. As Ryan indicated, we've got some pretty major uh, transportation projects in development. Um, when we consider these network uh, transportation projects as along with the agribusiness, commercial, and residential projects in development, plus the 2050 master plan being developed, um, what I'm going to provide tonight is some information on what fire protection could look like given these considerations along with um, for the next 30 years. The, the essence of this is, is I'll show at the end of this where I, I believe by relocating two fire stations, we can cover the city well for the next uh, 25 to 30 years along with improving coverage in already developed areas of the city. 
So as this first slide indicates, there's really two components that we're talking about when we're planning for fire protection, but there's also not one size that fits all communities. What's good for downtown New York, Philadelphia is different than what's needed for Grand Forks, just like is different than what's needed in rural North Dakota for all the smaller communities. But I believe by, because our city is a fairly homogenous, well-developed area by using industry best practices and NFPA standards as guidelines, we can, we can develop a pretty robust system that meets our needs. So the considerations for this presentation are the second, 42nd and Demers Avenue grade separation, the 47th Avenue and I-29 interchange, the new and residential commercial agribusiness developments, and the 2050 growth plan. And then also one that I believe is important that we look at in the future is the I-29 17th Avenue overpass. I know it's not currently one of our plans, but if the opportunity ever presented itself, I believe there's merit in re-looking at that. Uh, this presentation is going to focus primarily on fire station placement and how it impacts emergency vehicle response time. And all of the data in here, at the bottom of the slide, I described the components of call processing, turnout, and travel time that make up the total response time, but this presentation will focus on travel time only. And this is directly related to fire station placement and response from that station. So this slide depicts the current response map for the city's five fire stations. Um, how the dispatch center works, we have to come up with linear lines for them to be able to dispatch from. We can't make just this random shaped polygon that adds so many points that the dispatch center isn't able to de determine what unit to send on the response. So these response areas depict the primary single unit response from that fire station location. The different colors represents their primary response area. And I, I pointed out on this slide that Fire Station 3, where the blue star is, um, that we have relocated fire stations in the past. Um, and, and that was relocated to the Fire Station's current Station 3 down on South Columbia Road. That, that facility is now used by the police department as their annex. So just some historical data. The chart to the right depicts <coughs> call volume for the last uh, 10 years from 2011 up through 2021 along with where we're at today. We can see that there's a constant trajectory upward. Um, 20, 2020 we had a slight setback, you know, that was the COVID year and everything was a lockdown and call volumes actually decreased. But we're back up uh, to pre-COVID levels and with the 2022 numbers at the pace that we're at will exceed 6 thousand calls this year. And then to the left shows a breakdown of 2021's call for service in some very broad categories. And you can see the largest of the categories in the orange make up the rescue and EMS calls. These are primarily single unit calls and they make up about 70% of our calls. And this has been the norm for, for the last several years about that number of call volume. So this slide, <clears throat> some of you may have been on the council um, during previous presentations where we looked at the insurance service office mile and a half uh, diamonds. This is kind of a legacy system that was used in the past to depict fire station location. That's a mile and a half diamond from the fire station. Um, the downside to this approach is it doesn't take into traffic grid patterns, uh, roadblocks like railroad tracks and things like that. A more accurate method to determine response time is using um, GIS predicted travel time. So if you look at the bottom of this slide down here along fire station five, you can thank you, you can see that it's a fairly accurate to the ISO mile and a half diamond. It, it reflects a fairly consistent methodology there to those diamonds. But when we look at fire station four, the fire station up in the industrial park, we'll see that it really isn't an accurate depiction of the area. The bottleneck created at Demers causes the fire truck having to come out of that station and go all the way over there to get to that area. So 
the using the, the GIS four minute travel time prediction is a, is a more accurate methodology. So where does the four minute come from? That's the benchmark standard established by the National Fire Protection Association. That is, that is kind of the, the benchmark used particularly for cities our size for single unit on scene response. That's the time it takes for a fire truck to leave the station and arrive on scene. So this next slide <clears throat> depicts actual response data. The dots on the map show actual calls down in station five's area. The green dot represents a response where the unit responded and arrived in four minutes and less travel time. The red dots represent travel time five minutes and less. And so that is when responding from their fire station, or not, excuse me, that, that is response into that area regardless of where they were. So if you look around the fire station, you see a few red dots and you're going, well, that's awful close to the fire station. Why, is there, why are they red dots? There's numerous reasons. They could have been responding from another call on the other side of their area. They could have been out inspecting in their area. They could have been training out at the public safety center and another unit was taking those calls. It could have been winter time and there was road impacts and travel. And we have the human factor. Our company officers have to push a button on the MDC when they go en route and they arrive on scene. So if they happen to forget to push that button or they pushed it a little late, remember the five minute of the, dots could have been four minutes and 10 seconds. So, but when you look at the, the green and the red here, it covers that area very well. So I believe this adds credibility to this methodology of using the four minute predicted drive time from that fire station location. And then at the bottom of the map here, we see our future residential developments that are being discussed. Uh, the red orange line at the very bottom being Merrifield Road, showing that from fire station five, I have a hydro, degree of confidence that we should be able to cover those new developments with Fire Station 5's current location. Um, over on the left, you'll see that approximately 90% of the Station 5's calls are reached in five minutes or less, and that is consistent with industry best practices. And as I said before, approximately 70% of all calls in the city are EMS in nature, which are primarily single unit calls. So jumping up to our Station 4 location over in the industrial park, the red depicts the predicted four minute drive time from that area along with about two and a half years worth of calls citywide, each dot representing a call. The one dot that's different in here is the dark maroon dot down at the bottom. That represents a call greater than five minutes. This map also, I'm trying to depict the railroad tracks that impact response. The big one that we know of running east-west here where 42nd and Demers is a significant factor because station four to get up into this northwest portion of the city can either cross the tracks over here or it has to go up Demers uh, over to 42nd Street. And when there's a train on there, that causes a delay, significant delay. And station two then would respond from this area. So when you look at the dots here, our highest concentration of calls in the city that are greater than five minutes is this northwest portion. Um, we began tracking this data last year to know specifically how many times we are impacted by trains. Since September of 2021, we had 32 incidents citywide where we were impacted by train. To track that data, it requires the, the person filling out the incident report to actually check a box now that say they were delayed by training, meaning they had to train, find a different route or a different unit was sent. And 26 of those calls were north of Demers. So I am proposing uh, potentially relocating Fire Station 4, taking into consideration the 42nd Street and Demers over underpass. If you look at this map, I have placed this fire station along 13th Avenue and 42nd Street on, on a property. And then the blue area represents a predicted four minute travel time from that proposed location. So we can see that from this location, we cover almost all of the predicted area of, of station four, because we can see that over here, it's, it's right up against the west edge of the city. It has to go east 
and north to get over to this area. There's no direct line. By having that over underpass, we now have unimpeded access underneath those railroad tracks and to this northwest area of the city. Um, when the Public Safety Center was built in 2008, it was an opportunity to add a fire station because we were in desperate need of a public safety center. The fire station was a great opportunity out there, and I think at the time the, the thought was that the industrial park would grow faster than it has. And so given, given that fact, the grade separation and uh, at, at 42nd and Nemours, excuse me, um, it provides an awesome opportunity to provide better coverage to a large area of the city and already developed areas of the city. So using again about two and a half years worth of actual response data, green representing four minutes and less, red representing five minutes and less, and, and the dark maroon greater than five, we can see that this area has the highest concentration in the city of calls exceeding five minutes. You can see a lot of these dots are piled on top of each other, but it tells a pretty good story of where the call volumes are. Um, and we know that the, the public safety center at night in particular, when there's not people out there, is when they have their slowest call volume, south of Demers, west of I-29. So that tells a pretty good story. So moving to the next to look at the south side, you can see our fire station three and the shaded yellow area represents current predicted four minute travel time from station three's area. And you'll notice that it's very close to station five. Taking into consideration the 47th and I-29 interchange that's being developed and proposed, um, I believe that by relocating Fire Station 3 down into that location, we could considerably cover the city in the south end with those developments along with the 2050 growth plan. The dark black line on the outside of the map depicts the 2050 growth plan boundaries that Ryan showed us earlier. 47th Avenue being right here. I picked the hypothetical location just along there and then having IT and ArcGIS, we have to get somewhat of an accurate map. So it's not showing on here, but we actually place some hypothetical streets just to get a more accurate picture because the more street grid network is built out, the more accurate these maps get. So we can see the shaded yellow and here we have the shaded blue shows the difference in those two response areas and how we're covering down to the west and south. This map shows we have turned on the predicted drive time areas from Fire Station 1 on Demers, Fire Station 3 on South Columbia Road, Fire Station 4 in the Industrial Park, and Fire Station 5, the new station down on 47th Avenue. So we see how the city would currently be covered using those four minute predicted drive times. This shows how the coverage could be with the, the relocation of Fire Station 4 on 42nd and 13th Avenue approximately, and then a, a spot down on 47th. Now, this 47th one, this is a random spot on the map. We would very much have to watch the development area, see how the street infrastructure builds out. That could possibly be west of I-29. It could possibly be south farther to cover those areas. Uh, but what I wanted to point out here is the 17th Avenue and I-29 overpass. If we had an access from this location on 17th Avenue, you can see where hypothetically this whole area out to the 2050 growth plan would be blue. And just for comparative purposes, I, I looked at the number of over underpasses in Fargo versus Grand Forks. You know, we're very similar cities. We're both boundary, boundaried on the east by the Red River, and we both have I-29 that splits the city. It's very comparable in the makeup of the city. So you can see the map on the right shows Grand Forks with black being the full interchanges, red being the over underpasses, and green being the ones that are currently in, de in development. And then the Merrifield Road is down here on the very bottom of this map. It's not shown, but that's where it would be. And then in Fargo, in this 10 mile stretch, you can see that they have 12 ways over interstate along with the one in 64th currently being developed. 
and whereas we have the four along with the 47th that's being developed. But what I want to point out here is we have two mile stretch in the heart of our city with no access over I-29. So again, to reemphasize, I know it's not a priority for the city, it's not on our infrastructure projects, but I believe if an opportunity presented itself, it's worth looking at again. Moving up to the north end of the city, um, here we're looking at the Fufang uh, proposed development and the developed properties along Washington, along with future and current ag businesses. Fire Station 2, being right here on North Columbia Road, the yellow representing its current four minute predicted drive time. So we can see that for a single unit response, we're, uh, we're doing a great job of covering those areas in the north end of town. When you look at station four, again, the bottleneck coming up here to Demers, they're, they're from a second unit response, and we're not gonna get into this today, but we talk about single unit response primarily in this presentation. Well, there's another factor called effective response force, meaning how many resources and people do we need at the various type of incidents that co-occur. So you can see for a second unit here, this is about how far station four is getting in four minutes. Whereas looking at the proposed location on 42nd Street, um, having that uninterrupted access with the Demers and 42nd Street over underpass, we can now get all the way up to this area in that four minutes for that secondary response. So action items, if the opportunities present themselves, I think the, the priority would be to identify and acquire land for the relocation of Station 4 in the area of 42nd, 13th, at least start to explore that. And then the uh, near and long term, the one to ter ten year, are more of the watch and see. You know, we, we can acquire the land and, and possibly begin the, the construction of Fire Station 4 if the council so chooses to move that direction and then monitor that growth in the southwest very closely. I think that's going to be farther down the road. As Ryan mentioned, we now have Sanford that it's announced they've bought 60 plus acres down along that area that could cause development to come pretty quickly and then reconsider the evaluation of the 17th Avenue overpass if an opportunity presents itself. So that was a lot of information in a short amount of time. I uh, welcome any phone calls or, or, or reach out to me if you'd like to discuss any of this in more detail. And with that, I stand for questions. Questions for the chief? Yes, Mr. V. A couple quick questions. Um, is coverage time, um, the question that came to me is fire potential versus fire severity. I mean, are there certain types, we talk about moving somebody out of the industrial park mm -hmm. as a fan, and of course the type of fire you might have there, the severity would be different than you might have in a, in a residential area, mm -hmm. right? Is, is, if you look at it, do you treat all of them the same? Um, or do you look at that potential uh, where you, a larger fire might break out in your time to get to that? There's multiple components that I don't, have one short answer but the short answer is yes with our city and the type of staffing we have we kind of treat them the same because NFP actually sets standards for what your effective response force should be for the different type of facilities and they're substantially different but I want to point out that the biggest thing we can do it as a fire department in, especially in the industrial and commercial areas that you refer to, is make sure all the facilities are built to the most current codes. Most of, all of the buildings in the industrial mm -hmm. park are fully sprinkler. And a sprinkler system is designed to keep the fire in check until some, either in check or extinguished until crews get there to, to finish putting it out. And so when you look at most of our residential buildings, they're not sprinkler. And that's where our life safety concerns are. So. Yes, we treat them all the same, but yet it's kind of where our priority is. I, you know, life safety always takes a priority for me, and so I'm much more confident that the buildings in the industrial park right now, being fully sprinklered, are somewhat safer than a lot of our residential areas. And I think you probably get my other question, because what is more important in your mission, fire suppression or 
some of the life safety issues? Because I see a lot of your calls are not for fire calls. Exactly. The priority of our mission is fire, definitely, because nobody else does that, right? We have all true ambulance provides uh, ALS support. However, our strategic location of our buildings allows to get to many of those medical calls before the ambulance does. That's one of the main reasons. We I think respond. typically you do. I would, yeah. I would guess that you do. But, um, but to, to make your point, nobody else does fire, nobody else does hazardous materials, nobody else does technical rescue, but the fire department. So those are our priority, but yet the community need is a lot of the EMS side. What do you see about the future residential sprinkler systems? I am 100% in support of them, but I can tell you that if you go out to the state, there's a lot of building associations that are not in support of them. Is it, aren't they currently required in Minnesota if you build a home over 5,000 square feet? There is a stipulation in Minnesota where they are required. I don't remember the exact square footage. And so at Minnesota some point, adopts the state of, core. Yes, at some point, the state of North Dakota will probably follow Minnesota, which they seemingly always do. We've fought that fight out there, and it gets ugly pretty fast. Mm -hmm. It certainly adds to the cost of new construction. It's about a buck and a half a square foot. Mm -hmm. Yep, it is. Any uh, any other questions for the chief? Mr. Uh, just a couple quick things. Uh, chief Lorenz, I think you and I talked about this a little while ago or a couple weeks ago after a meeting. Um, I've always said that the northwest corner of Grand Forks uh, has some issues when it comes to response because of the railroad tracks and the blockages that occur. Um, based on your experience, what's the difference between a fire that's lasting four minutes and a, a fire that's lasting over five minutes in response time? There's a lot of variables in that too. It depends on where the fire started and what type of fuel load is there. Um, but one minute is pretty significant in some cases particularly if it's on the outside of the house and you've got combustible signing that goes up to the soffits, um, they can spread really quickly. Um, and you, back to the four minute thing and, and why the four minute mark, there's actually several factors, but two of the most common that they use for that argument is one, when a fire reaches flashover, it, 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 confined fire in a, inside a building. And the second is when brain death begins to occur following cardiac arrest and lack of oxygen to the brain. And so that four minute drive time is determined to get responders to the scene in that amount of time to prevent both of those things from happening. So one minute in some cases can be substantial and in other cases not as substantial. I know that doesn't answer your question directly, but it but it is kind of a broad Absolutely, statement. Yeah. But I can tell you from a life safety perspective and getting somebody out of a fire, one minute is a lifetime. Perfect. And, and I would agree with you. I think something needs to be done to better serve um, the northwest corner of Grand Forks. Um, I think we've talked, I think Mr. Brooks talked about development on the northwest corner of Grand Forks as a potential as well. Um, so something obviously needs to be done there. Um, I'm glad that, that this is being looked at and hopefully um, we have some solutions pretty quickly to it. Thank you, Mr. Weigel. Uh, Mr. Weber, yes, sir. Yes, please. Uh, Chief Lorenz, uh, I had come in and, and talked to you and you had given me this presentation earlier. Um, I'm expecting that uh, while we're not passing a motion tonight or necessarily voting, uh, Mr. Phelan, Ms. Storstad would be looking for a green light to move forward with those action steps. Is, is that correct? And then I've, I've got another comment. <laughs> Council President Sandy and Council Member Weber, yeah. Just kind of get your feedback. Obviously budget season is coming and one of the first out things are, are really the land and also the construction. And I think it's important to note that we're really reassigning firefighters to different locations. And so this specific specifics um, action would not require additional people. We're just trying to reallocate the people to a better locations and trying to do it in a long-term way so that we don't miss really good opportunities. Um, and so as part of the budget discussion, I think that we wanted to get your feedback as part of the mayor's budget. 
Right. It's worth noting uh, that uh, moving a fire station is not the same ex expense as uh, building a new one. In fact, primarily because of the uh, the human resource aspect that you've just mentioned. Uh, so I would, uh, I for one, would uh, be in support of offering a green light to move forward with uh, uh, the, the the recommendations by Chief Lorenz and looking into that and bringing back more information. Uh, in addition to that, uh, the reason that I came out and spoke with you that day, Chief, was uh, about uh, f fire protection for the proposed Fufung plant. Um, and uh, you did mention it during your uh, presentation, but fairly briefly, uh, to summarize quickly, there is currently uh, adequate uh, single vehicle support for that entire area with our, our current infrastructure. Um, and the uh, proposed changes would uh, bolster that with uh, uh, the, the second vehicle response. But as you've also mentioned, uh, a plant, a, a new plant built with the latest technology would have uh, uh, fire suppression technology built into it. Uh, so that would, uh, th that's an important part of the equation as well. But essentially at this point, if the plant goes forward, we are able to offer uh, the, the support needed out there. Is that right? That is correct. Um, I pulled up the map here again for a single unit response. You can see that it's within our four minute predicted drive time and that the tertiary response by relocating station four does get that second unit. And then of course, station one would get there at approximately the same time t for assistance. Um, but you're also correct that the single biggest thing we can do with those northern developments is ensure that they're built to the most current codes. And uh, not, not to dwell on it, but the uh, the development agreement with Fu Fung, uh, we're looking at 20 different areas of, of concern uh, doing our due diligence. One of those areas was uh, safety and fire. So uh, thanks, thanks for the presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Any other comments? Um, Chief, have you looked? We, we currently own about 20 acres of land just across the street from where you're talking about on uh, 42nd. Yep, and we picked this spot. Um, Ryan and I did some brief conversations just because of the proximity, but uh, I think looking at anything that the city currently owns is certainly mm -hmm. should be done. Sure. Um, I, I'm not going to drag Grasser up here, but I am interested in at some point knowing an estimated cost difference for having a full interchange and whether we can actually have a full interchange at 17th versus just the overpass because uh, after our most recent concert there was some concern and consternation from some people that it took a significant amount of time for egress uh, ingress for, for getting out of the Alara Center and getting in um, for the big concerts and so I don't know if we can wrap a an eloquent solution into this or not. I'm not sure if there's enough space there to put in an actual. But anyway, we can talk about that uh, next time we talk about this. Thanks, Chief. Thank you. Excellent. I am interested in knowing how much two new uh, fire stations are going to cost. So getting more information would be very good. And then if we have to plan for it, we have to plan for it. So. Moving right along, last but not least, Item uh, 214, Transit Development Plan Update from the MPO. Ms. Kuba, good evening. Good evening. Can, uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm sure you have a lot of information. Can we uh, work to hit the highlights tonight? And... That is what I hope to do. Great. did open in the folder. No. Oh, it's already open on the bottom. There. Okay. <laughs> All right. Yes, I do hope to be as brief as possible. Um, but we are 
in the middle of this plan. We've done, we've been working on this since we've got, we had a consultant on board in July and we've been working on this plan since, since then pretty much right off the bat as soon as possible. Um, some of the things we've already really accomplished is kind of that existing conditions, uh, getting f financial baselines um, and so that we can start our forecasts. Um, we've done our first round of engagement and um, we're starting looking at our second round of engagements. So just kind of briefly going over our existing conditions report. These are kind of the highlights of our, our existing conditions uh, throughout. We wanted to make sure we're getting a full understanding of what the transit system is like as it exists today. Um, so our performance is actually kind of online with everything else. Yes, we have been decreasing, but it matches uh, in ridership, but it matches national trends. We do have three very good routes, um, and most of those routes were moving uh, very well in 2019. Uh, of course, 2020 hit, and then everything else kind of went downhill from there. Um, we've looked at our on-demand, our demand response, which is kind of a paratransit service combined with a senior rider service. And we've seen a, it's mostly been pretty steady, um, but we've seen a, the, the, that decrease in 20, 2020. Um, another performance takeaway we have is our uh, system re reliability and safety. We're well within national trends. Um, we do look at our fare box uh, recovery as well as the fares that we are are requiring of the riders. Um, we do look at, at ourselves in comparison to peers. Um, some of those peers have changed. Um, most of them have not, but they are definitely ones that have the similar ridership. They have a similar um, community makeup. Um, they're, they're a college town. They have a, a growth happening within their their areas. Um, just kind of looking at, at some of those major points, um, as you can see, along with our peers, where our ridership is declining, just like theirs is. Um, we're pretty steady at those that miles per capita, which is a pretty good uh, lever leveling view of how those systems are working. Um, passengers per revenue mile, uh, we're, we've been going down in comparison to some of our, our peers, but some of those peers have been going down as well. Then we're looking at costs per trip and that we've, we've uh, looked at some increases in costs, but uh, overall, some, especially kind of in that 2019 period, we've, we've seen our peers do the very same thing. Um, fare box, we've seen that decrease as well as our peers. And when we were looking at that fare comparison, we in previous times we've plans we've looked at just that that uh, single ride. Put it in, put your dollar fifty in, or if you're uh, K through 12, 12, or you have a, a access to a reserve a reduced fare. But we are knowing, noticing that increase in usage of multiple ride passes and multiple day passes. Um, that is being used, so we, we really needed to look and see how our peers are comparing to that as well. The, the, I guess the major takeaway is the fact that is we are doing just as well in across the board as our peers are, um, especially with our um, our uh, 
system reliability and safety. Uh, the reliability came in uh, increased immensely when we were looking at when we changed those routes back in 20, the middle of 2018. And this is this was a good opportunity. If COVID hadn't hit, this would have been a great opportunity to really see how well those changes had had improved our system. Um, we we're dealing with what we're dealt with, and we're looking, but we're we're still looking at what can be improved and what we should be looking at. And we have some some ideas on that, and I'm going to get a little bit more detail into those a little bit. Uh, further in. Um, the biggest thing is, is that we're also looking at a financial baseline so that we can estimate costs into the future. So we're, we're trying to look 10 years into the future. We know we will only have a solid five years of, of true what's going to happen, but we do want to be able to look a little further in the future to make a few more plans that might influence some current decisions. We do have remaining funds from the various COVID uh, bills that have funneled money towards transit and other uh, infrastructure. And we are still looking for kind of that idea of where where uh, uh, transit is going to come out, especially with the new a transportation bill. Just kind of a, a baseline financial, the costs of the providing transit service, that would be everything from our fixed route to our uh, dialer ride and senior rider service. And we looked at what those expenses are being looked at as well. So we're kind of even in revenue as well as expenses. Um, going into the future, we're looking at some funding growth with the new bill, of course, but we're not sure how much, we're, we're leaning towards being very conservative with that, just so that we will know we're more comfortable when we say we're going to be purchasing certain things for the, the transit system into the future. And that's for both Grand Forks and East Grand Forks. We had our first round of engagement in October. Um, we did public surveys. We got on the buses and we talked to the riders. We, I sent out uh, surveys to the city council members as well as um, planning commission members and things like that and decision makers because we want to hear what you're hearing as well as what we're hearing from the riders as well as the general public. We had the opportunities to uh, have uh, those surveys were paper as well as online and the, then we had an interactive map and we tried to get some additional input by doing focus groups. Um, one of those focus groups, which was the businesses, led to a kind of a mini round of additional surveys to the businesses themselves. Uh, just kind of a rundown of what kind of responses we were getting for COVID and age and, and all of that. Um, but in the surveys itself, kind of that, we were trying to gauge, okay, what, what is the most important things? And we're seeing kind of that more locations, more often the bus comes and um, followed quickly by the later service, early service. Um, and the needed locations, we, because we heard so much about the industrial park, which was another reason why we were looking at the businesses and the grocery stores and other places. We, we really wanted to get some more detailed information from the business community. Um, we also looked at, heard from all these groups as to kind of some of those improvement pieces, uh, service to the industrial park, um, having more 
available information about when buses are coming and how often and uh, kind of that marking, mar marketing aspect. Um, also having more direct routes or, yeah, to places. Um, once again, we're hearing the same things from the decision makers of strengths and availability of service and the timeliness, which were are pretty good in performance measure, measures for bus service overall. Um, looking for improvements, this is once again from the decision maker survey, you know, those later hours of, of operation. Um, you know, improvements to shelters and, you know, those needed travel time and increased frequency, which is what we were hearing from the riders as well. And those feedback from our focus groups, we had once again, the same, pretty much the same information coming back, which was what led to that survey for the business. So we had a, we, we had a good response from the business community and we had a varied response from the business community. So we had some really big employers and we had some smaller employers. And so, you know, that ended up being some very good information for us, especially when we're going forward and looking at what kinds of uh, changes or service ideas we're going to go to into the future. And in that survey, we asked if they would, if there was access, um, if they thought people would have like that. And another aspect was um, whether or not kind of where their employees were going to be located kind of in the north side or just a general idea of where, where people are located that need to get to their businesses. So after that round of information, we kind of came back and with, came up with some service ideas uh, for improvement, um, some route changes to improve efficiency, um, some service span changes, some incorporation of microtransit. And uh, that's where we're getting into our round two now. And that's going to be starting here very soon, uh, that actually this week. We'll have a public meeting here on April 14th at East Grand Forks City Hall. Um, we're looking at, we have new goals for our, this transit plan. They're more concise, more relatable to people. This is the point of our document from now on is going to be making sure people understand what they're reading when they're reading this document and leaving the necessary um, numbers and methodologies and all of that out of the general. <laughs> nobody, nobody but staff really wants to look at that anyway. Um, but we do have some draft service ideas. Uh, there's some service changes. We're looking at incorporating some of that micro transit, which is just, you know, and making sure routes go in one direction or stay on the same route. So that if they're going in two different directions, they're always going on the same roads. So we're not confusing people. Um, and looking at operation services, but that micro transit it's not, it's not like Uber, it's not like Lyft, it's you, where it's similar is you have an app and you do go and you can request an on-demand or you can request a uh, pickup in advance, but it's in a defined area and it's on, generally on a street corner somewhere in that defined area. So it's kind of a combination of Uber, Lyft and, um, transit, fixed route transit is how I'd like to explain it. Um, so this is a new concept and we don't want it to be thought of as that they can ride this, use this micro transit at any time of the day. It'll only be during fixed times of the day that transit is running. 
So our normal transit hours. Um, some of these service ideas that we're going to be putting out there are, are listed there. Some trying to get more frequency on our most popular routes, like Route 5, which goes out to the Gateway Walmart and then goes, then heads into the downtown, as well as kind of dividing up Route 7 so that we can get more direct routes for people. And Route 7 is another one of our more popular routes. Um, I think the biggest one is kind of introducing that idea of a, a route into the industrial park as well so that we can serve, it, serve that need that has been um, desired by our surveys and the public information that we've gathered. And we do have some new ideas for East Grand Forks. East Grand Forks would be more of a, more of the micro transit with a single route going through the main part of the city. CAT does do UND routes, their, their campus shuttle. So we have kind of come up with some ideas to make those routes more, um, accessible, especially for the students on campus. So in, by bringing out some of those routes onto, for example, 43rd, where there's a lot of students living there, they can then get on the bus and go straight in, into campus without having to uh, transfer at any time onto a, a university shuttle bus. Um, just making sure we're not over running some of those routes and, and getting to most of that, those other areas. But the biggest thing would be introducing that micro transit on campus at night, which would help um, with, might help the actual university police where the, those, that micro transit will get closer to where those students are located on campus to get them to various uh, locations on campus, like their parking lots. Um, once again, we have uh, our first info session about all of these possible changes or possible service changes is on April 14th. Um, we're keeping an eye on the storm, of course but we are planning on it being online as well. So we shouldn't have too much trouble with that. Um, but we're just giving out those ideas and explaining those ideas and giving some education. So come Thursday, April 21st, we hope to have focus group, have a focus group of writers and possible users to give us their input. So we're listening more than speaking on that on the 21st. Um, other than that, we are, hopefully we'll have a little bit more interaction with you guys now because we will have a lot more information uh, on the decision points coming up. We're kind of a little over halfway through and we'll be having, um, once we have these recommendations figured out, we should have, be moving quite quickly into a final or draft plan. Great, thank you, Ms. Kuba. Yep. Appreciate that great information. Does anyone have any have any questions on the new CAT plan? Mr. Weigel or Mr. Weber? Ms. Dockler? No, thank you. Okay. No, great. thank you. No, thanks. Thank you very much. Okay. Appreciate it. Yep. Um, thank you. Nothing else on the agenda tonight? Is there a motion to adjourn? So moved. Moved by Weigel. Is there a second? second? Second by Weber. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Motion carries. We're adjourned.